My name's Tim Jones, I'm the Artistic Director of the Seymour Centre and I just wanted to firstly welcome you very briefly because tonight is the beginning of Seymour's Vivid program. Uh, the whole, we're part of the University of Sydney as you know and last night the University kicked off its amazing light program uh, uh, on the, uh, the, the main quadrangle, the main quad building and I do encourage you after tonight, if you're feeling like a walk, to go across there at the end after you've done everything with us and uh, go and have a look at the lights there because they really are terrific. So, so uh, you know, please do that as well. Um, we have an amazing uh, talk for you tonight, an author's called The Future of Music, as you know, and it begins a week where we have some really terrific concerts which explore, also explore that theme. And I just wanted to very lightly encourage you or to touch you, and for those of you that don't know, that on Thursday night we have in this room, there are three concerts to firstly start with, three um, which is Elson Price is performing uh, with new compositions for double bass, mandolin and computer. Um, uh, on Friday night, again, new music for recorder from Alana Blackburn and Joe Arnott. And then on Saturday night, a really terrific thing, uh, Daniel Blinkhorn and Robert Evans are converting this room into a complete sort of surround atmosphere with speakers and audience sit in the middle and kind of have a total experience of, of sound from uh, and original compositions from those artists. So I really do encourage you to come along to those. Another work that's in the other theatre directly across there is Gothic by the composer Andre Greenwall and she has done these fantastic compositions for a, a six piece and two, two, uh, two singers and uh, they are terrific, I guess, inspired by Gothic movies, uh, compositions that we would think of as being particularly Gothic are their Wuthering Heights thriller, new, really sort of new takes on them, it's really fantastic. So I encourage you to get involved in that as well. But tonight a talk, uh, a great talk with these fantastic people and to introduce them, can I introduce Dr Leanne Loke, Senior Lecturer, lecturer from the Ar uh, Faculty of Architecture. Thank you. Great, thank you very much Tim. It's wonderful to be here. Uh, welcome everybody, thank you for coming along tonight. Um, I'm also the curator of the Musify Gamify exhibition with um, my co-curator here, Oli Baum, which we'll talk about in a little moment. But I'd first like to just acknowledge and pay respects to the tr traditional owners of the land, uh, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, um, and to the elders past and present. Um, this uh, Sydney Ideas uh, talk panel, um, which has been set up by Meredith Hall, is actually the third time that um, we've brought together Sydney Ideas with the Vivid Ideas. And uh, we've got a really interesting um, conversation that will go on tonight on the future of music and how interactive technologies are changing music experience. Um, we have four um, wonderful panellists with us tonight. Um, I'll introduce each of them. So first of all, we have Stephen Ferris here on my left, who's a curator of Vivid Music this year. Stephen has over 45 years in the music industry. Um, some of you may know Stephen from his uh, pop font bang Flotsam and Jetsam in the 80s, I certainly do. Um, and he's been a club DJ since 1983, still working uh, as a DJ for some uh, private clients, uh, such as Prince, uh, the Packer family, and Bill Gates. Uh, a bit of <laughs> and Oprah, and uh, Princess Mary and Prince Frederick. So a good mix of politics, royalty, and celebrity there. <laughs> so try and get to one of your parties. And Stephen also works on radio with several um, shows that he's done. Um, at the latest uh, ones are on FBI um, and doing something called Cold, uh, what's it called? Cold League Show Fire Up. Okay. It's a weird question, mm. isn't it? <laughs> Very diverse. Yes. Okay, the next uh, speaker is Ollie Bowen, who's a researcher and maker working with creative technologies. Um, Ollie's currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Design Lab at this, uh, in the Faculty of Architecture, Design and Planning, University of Sydney. Um, his diverse academic background sp spans social anthropology, evolutionary adaptive systems, music informatics and interaction design, and he has a 15 year career spanning electronic uh, music and digital art. Um, he's also interested in, in his research and working with advanced computing technologies such as biologically inspired algorithms to produce complex creative outputs, and Ollie will probably speak to some of that uh, in a moment. Um, next up we have Matt Oxley, uh, who works for DDB, um, and uh, apparently Matt has lived and breathed digital for your entire 16 years is at, uh, in your career, yep. um, and has worked across the globe on various projects, um, uh, creating various inventive and creative apps and installations, um, from small applications on mobile phones to large-scale technology platforms. And um, he's uh, earned his clients the highest accolades um, in that arena and was listed in the Creativity Top 50 in 2010 for the best creative people. Um, so welcome Matt. And we also have Damien Rickardson, last but not least, um, who's a composer and lecturer at the Sydney Conservatorium of Music. Uh, much of Damien's music explores the poetics of incomplete knowledge. 
Through open forms and unconventional modes of notation, Damien's works are themselves incomplete, requiring high levels of creative interaction from the performers. Um, so Damien's also the uh, co-artistic director of Ensemble Offspring, um, who are a very experimental um, a, a band of musicians who will actually be performing on Friday night as part of the Music by Gamify concert series. Okay, so welcome to all our speakers. Now we're going to have a, a discussion um, with our speakers around the topic of the future of music. Uh, and then after we've done that, we will open up to audience Q&A. So it's, as, as we're going, just keep those questions in your pocket and then we'll have some time um, for you to actually ask questions to our panel. So I'm going to start with Stephen. So in your role as a curator of Vivid Music, a um, couple of things. Can you speak to the overlap between the light and the music programs and how this idea of, I guess, these new uh, approaches to music making and technology yeah. feature? Look, I mean, one of the things that I would like to change at Vivid is that we do have the, these three separate areas, the ideas, the music, and um, the lights. And often they do work separately. Like a lot of my music acts just do the music. Occasionally they provide music for one of the installations, like the presets have done one down Darling Harbour, but a lot of the lighting pieces uh, are integrally involved with um, the technology uh, with sound, so that, for example, you'll have you know, drums that you can hit which change colours, really simple ways, or they trigger samples, or there's another one with lasers, mm -hmm. and if you touch the laser, like a, like a harp, different notes go off. Uh, there's, there's a multitude of those things that if you go and discover, there's a piano stairs, just like in that film with Tom Hanks, that you can run up and down at the A&P building. So, in that area, uh, which is outside of this sort of the, the, the curating of, of musical acts, uh, where they do come together very well, um, they're sort of put together by the lighting people with music involved. So, yeah, that's I mean that's pretty interesting. I mean, I, I come to music as a fan from from day one. It was it was always lusting after the records, spending hours going through import stores and buying the vinyl, and then you know going into a band and then buying musical equipment that it was you know technologically based, moving from a saxophone to a you know, a, 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 a Roland SH1, a monophonic beast, you know, to a, a DX, DX7, which had the first menus, and all that technology changes the way music happens. So there's mm -hmm. no doubt that technology, to me, has a, a huge impact on music, and you can see it now that with the cost of laptops or the cost of technology or, or apps or whatever, uh, it affects what's coming out. And, you know, individuals will pick up that, unfortunately, as opposing to, to do 10 years with a piano or, a, or a, you know, a double bass or whatever. So, but what I see in my, in my years at FBI with all the new music that's coming, it's coming like a, a tsunami because people have got access to making music so cheaply and so quickly that we have 100,000 times fold the amount of music coming at us now than we ever used to, to the point where I know that all of us at the radio station are, are nearly overwhelmed and engulfed by it, and it doesn't make it any better. You still get talented people, and you get people who want to dabble who are not so talented and you have to sift through it all. And, and, and that's sort of part of my role, I suppose, to pick the eyes out of things to what I see should be ex, you know, exposed to people. But with respect to interactive uh, technology, there is this big sort of play with musicians now connecting with other musicians around the world to do remixes or to do live recordings or to basically just passing tracks back and forward via the net. So the, you know, this whole world has opened up where you don't even have to admit them. You just you, know, you email or go on their Facebook page and go, I've got this track, do you want to work with me? And everybody, most musicians say yes. So everybody's collaborating to, to further you know, their, their creative interests, I suppose. The downside, I think, of that is that sometimes great music comes from being isolated and being a part of a context and a time. So Southern Blues came about because of you know, African you know, slaves, etc., etc., and poverty and all the rest of it. You know. Uh, New York disco came about for a very different reason. So I often wonder whether all this sort of blurring of the global sort of world will then take some of the idiosyncrasies out of the music that's being made. That's just a, a concern. It's not necessarily true. But it definitely speeds everything up. And I think everybody wants quick, easy access to doing what they do. Uh, I've got a nine-year-old who sits on his iPad making a song in 10 minutes, you know, doesn't make it any good, once again, but he, he wants to do it. And eventually he may come up with something that's very, very good, you know, and very quickly too. So I think it's going to have a big effect. The other thing, of course, is in the, in the, in the marketplace, uh, you know, I personally, as I said, used to spend two hours traveling to the city, buying the brand new record by Lou Reed, had never heard it, just saw a review, opened the, you know, the wrapping and got home and went, oh, it's good or it's bad. You know, now, of course, I can sit up at midnight or whatever and go, like we all can, oh, I like that song, or download like that mm -hmm. song. I think they're now developing, going direct from artists to consumers or to fans, where you can, you can have apps and you can buy direct 
whatever the artist wants to give you. So it could be an exclusive release or a remix you can't get anywhere else or something three weeks before the official date or some merchandise or whatever, which requires mail. But I, I think there's, a, there's an opening of all those sorts of possibilities with musicians or artists and, and fans and buyers. So mm. I think that's pretty exciting. Mm. I think you've touched on some really great themes there that um, we just made some notes about um, a more demo democratic approaches to music making mm. and consumption. and. Um, this idea of the direct exchange between artist and musician, which probably Ollie um, might like to talk to. So I was going to ask Ollie, um, uh, computation and interactivity are like two main ingredients you use in a lot of your creative practice, and um, also with some idea maybe the direct exchange between the audience and the artist. Do you want to talk to that? Um, yeah. So I come from a background uh, of uh, well, kind of two things that have been converging over a very long time, and have maybe just about converged. Uh, one is just being an electronic music producer, um, working uh, probably sometimes very much in the same way as Stephen, um, and the other uh, being uh, a researcher who's interested in, in uh, how we can use technologies, um, uh, actually partly in the world of computer science, looking at models of, of complex systems and so on. Um, and those have, those have really converged to the point of looking at how we can use creative technologies in um, uh, music production and performance in uh, basically there's no one specific uh, area that I focus on but just in the great diversity of ways that we can work and so I mean coming back to a point that you just made that uh, in, in Vivid we have um, these streams like music ideas um, clearly there is uh, I, I guess it is stimulated and, and welcomed whilst also being categorized we have these really um, interesting overlaps that of course are, are timeless I mean um, those boundaries have never been particularly solid boundaries, but um, for what, what I'm particularly interested in in music practice uh, as it's happening at the moment is the diversity of ways in which you can produce uh, a musical output through software. Um, you might That might be in the form of releasing a piece of software, um, it might be in the form of uh, performing live with software in novel ways or um, using software to produce an output. Um, and I mean, certainly, just coming back to the question, you know, the, the overlap between um, uh, audiovisual performance, uh, visual, visual work, um, music, and the interaction happening in all of those areas uh, is is kind of a constant source of transformation. Um, so, uh, a, a project that, as I kind of became more interested in working with software as a medium for uh, music production. Um, I, I've been involved in a few things that focus on live improvisation um, and using software as a, a thing that improvises, not just as a tool that works as uh, an instrument, but actually a thing that has some agency and some behavior. So that's one of the areas that um, I find really interesting. But that, uh, it's funny how when you work in those areas, you create, um, you fall into niches that you didn't necessarily intend to fall into, but you fall into this um, in that case, heavily free improvised music niche, which has it has certain um, restrictions that appear to impose themselves on you. So, in search of um, other ways to work, uh, I, I engaged in a project a few years ago with my band Icarus, which is myself and my cousin, who's based in the UK. Um, and what we set out to do was to make an album in a thousand variations. So, we wanted to make a record that we could. Um, we could call it a generative record. It was produced by a, a generative process. Um, but we also wanted to be able to do that in a way that adhered to a whole load of um, traditions in electronically produced music. So one of the main things was that we wanted that record to be something that you could download and you could put on your MP3 player or whatever. Um, and you'd gain a familiarity with it because it was a, a, a fixed thing. Um, but the only kind of special touch to that was that that fixed thing was different for each person that got a copy of it. So that was a kind of, um, not just an, not, not just a, you know, what can we do um, with computers, but also uh, a kind of real study of, of the process of producing, uh, you know, facing a load of challenges in, in how to actually produce the music so that you achieve the goals you wanted to achieve, but then also looking at how someone at the other end is experiencing that. Um, you know their personal experience of the music, how that relates to what other people are doing, and so on. So that just, I mean, as one project that just kind of highlighted um, through doing that how um, 
I mean, for me, that's just one of so many ways that we can we can now use technology to kind of question what what records are, what CDs are, what live performances are, um, and I could reel off loads of other interesting examples. And of course, some of them are. Uh, in the exhibition that we've got upstairs, and some of them are uh, going to be playing on Friday and Saturday night. Yeah, I feel very honoured to have a copy of the Fake Fish distribution. <laughs> One of 1,000, is it? Special yeah. editions? Yeah. yeah. I'm not, I don't know who the other 999 <laughs> <laughs> people are, but I feel like I'm part of a special tribe <laughs> having a copy of that. <laughs> okay, thank you, Ollie. So, um, Matt, yeah. so I think um, some of the work that you've done. Um, in the commercial sector about making music adaptive to different kinds of contexts does pick up on, you know, in a way, what Ollie was talking about, yeah, but definitely. probably in a different slant. So did you want to talk about some of the, uh, your yeah, sure. I mean, in that area? Yeah, I mean, based on my experience, there's one thing I do know, and that's I'm not a musician. Um, <laughs> but I am a techie, and I love, um, I love data. And I guess that's one of the big inputs into well, it's generative music. Um, so that's really where my passion point lies and how I can bring that to life for people creating the compositions and the, um, and the apps further on down the stream. Um, I guess from my experience, there's, there's kind of three key areas that um, I've always focused on in terms of data and what gives us interesting and unique opportunities as inputs for the music. Um, one is the surroundings. Um, other is um, you know, your actions, so real time, what am I doing, how are we tracking that? Um, and the other one is, is feeling. So how am I feeling like physically or emotionally? Um, and it's how we can um, monitor those and, and use those as inputs um, to project work. Um, so a lot of it is kind of implicit and, and inferred. Um, and I think the first one, going back to surroundings, um, you know, using GPS data, so whether we go macro um, or micro, so whether we're using um, short range um, location technology um, or, like I said, GPS um, for broader reach. Um, you know, looking at a lot of the open um, data projects, so things like open street map data. So if we know someone's position, what can that tell us about the area they're in, urban, you know, the, uh, the countryside, mm. um, what locations are they near? Um, also, government um, data strategies more and more now open up huge reams of publicly available data, which is geolocated. So, whether that's crime maps or you know whatever it might be, you know how can we use those um, and combine those in ways that you know about where you are um, to provide interesting inputs into technology. Um, actions, you know, we all have our mobile phones on us. They all have accelerometers. You know, the moment when an accelerometer was made, small enough to fit the mobile phone, was a really defining moment in terms of tracking people and what they do. Um, and I think that physical action and what we're doing, whether that's, you know, whether with my project that's upstairs, whether it's we're in a vehicle or whether it's you walking around, you know, you can use, you know, those accelerometers to track your gait as you walk. Um, it can track, um, you know, the differences in your gait so it knows if you, you know, your phone could detect if you have a limp, for instance. How's that going to affect the music? Probably badly. Um, uh, you know, video analysis and tracking as well. So whether that's using video analysis within the environment um, or whether it's on your own phone. And I think, you know, the, the, like I said, the physical and emotional feeling side of things. So, um, you know, heart rate monitors, for instance, you know, I use one every day um, for cycling, but, um, you know, you can use it for a multitude of other things. So come back to your point about, um, you know, technology, um, it's become so cheap now, and these monitors are so cheap that anyone can get their hands on them, anyone can take them apart, you know, and reinvent um, how we detect things. And, you know, health monitors, you know, detecting breathing patterns, um, detecting how we're feeling, whether it's electrical signals in our brains, you know, there's a technology for all of these things, they can all be inputs. I wouldn't recommend using them all at once because you probably look a little bit, <laughs> a little bit weird. Um, <coughs> but through the broad project that's upstairs for, um, for Volkswagen that we did, um, uh, you know, there was a number of things that we tried and tested, and there's a lot of things that, quite frankly, didn't work um, and were pretty bad. You know, the heart rate monitor, when we had a direct relationship so you could hear your heartbeat in real time through, through the car's um, uh, sound system, it just felt a bit, bit too gimmicky. It wasn't very musical. It didn't have that integrity. So back to your point about anyone can produce a piece of music, but um, you need the help of musicians to actually control that and curate that. And Sorry, make there's it. an entity in Vivid where they do exactly that. Right. They tap into your heartbeat and it changes the... <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, 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 but that direct reaction, the interaction is quite mm -hmm. good, but when it comes to music, it's, yes. it's not so good. Yes. But, and we also you know, looked at the indirect influences of that, but actually what we realised that it's not strong enough 
relationship to the person, the user, to, for them to really notice and to, to feel immersed within it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, looking at, yeah, I think it's a really fine line between um, uh, knowing what you're influencing and maintaining that magic with the music and your interaction with it. I think mm -hmm. that's a, it's a really interesting kind of area. But um, I guess every year we're increasing the number of data points that we create um, as individuals. Um, and you know, for me, the most interesting opportunity is creating a deeper understanding of, um, of ourselves and the, and the data we produce and also the environments we're in. Um, I think the environmental one we were just talking about, you know, all the signals that you can't hear, you know, how do we tap into that? I think there's, a, there's massive opportunities. And then obviously you've got every permutation um, mm. of those combined. Mm. Oh, yeah, so the, um, the piece that Matt was talking to is called Play the Road, and it's actually, there's a, a documentary film in the exhibition upstairs that you can check out later on that really interesting project. Um, and I'll, I'll have a follow-on question from what you talked about a little bit later, but okay. we'll just move on to um, Damien. <laughs> so Damien, um, we're just going to use your academic background. Uh, <laughs> so you can give us a bit of an insight into perhaps um, with any of these trends in the evolution of, um, I guess, music generation and composition. Uh, are they surprising or the natural evolution of what's come before? Um, look, I, I think there, there are some spectacular new frontiers emerging from some of this kind of how you use this data in a musical kind of way. But I think it is worth acknowledging that there is a history that's sort of connecting interactivity and game-like processes in, in music making. Like if, even in the Western classical tradition, there's all of these crazy ancient machines that spit out perm permutations of music, or even, you know, composers, you know, even Mo the Mozarts and Haydn's who sometimes use game-like processes, throwing giant dice and whatnot to actually create music. Um, yeah, that these sort of um, modular or multi-formed kind of works are, are, do have historical precedence. Uh, and actually it's interesting to note with those kind of um, Mozart or Haydn that these works are not intended for the revered and sacred kind of concert hall um, as we might experience it today, but were actually social games, um, you know, for parlour room kind of entertainment, you know, very early forms of sort of participatory kind of art in a way, you know, very... Um, creative kind of entertainment. Look, one of the, the guys who's been uh, probably the most influential um, on my own artistic practice is actually the theoretical writings of Umberto Eco, and particularly his ideas on, on the open work. So, you know, this is a guy who is as early as the 50s was, was basically arguing that the, you know, artistic forms always reflect the belief systems in which a culture or society views reality. So, yeah, for example, if we live in a world that starts to question a singular reality, like, you know, the one true God or one scientific, scientific truth, and starts to embrace or acknowledge possibilities of multiple realities or logics, then theoretically this will be reflected in the cultural forms of the day, you know, including a move away from sort of fixed or scripted types of um, uh, forms, artistic forms, towards more fluid forms of art and entertainment that can deliberately play out in a multitude of, of kind of ways. And I think this is, you know, you can see here, you know, he's predicting the foundations of much of our cultural activity today, you know, as, as some of is evident here, or, you know, everything from reality TV through to gaming culture in a way. Um, look, the influence of this type of thinking, I think, in the, the classical music sector, which is where more where I occupy, has been this sort of challenging of the idea that the musical work is a fixed sonic entity, something that is, you know, represented in a score and then executed by a performer striving for some kind of ideal of the of the sole composer. Um, and certainly, you know, this is evident in the post-war avant-garde music where there's this great big embracing of indeterminacy or chance, you know, with your figures such as John Cage and whatnot. Um, and now we have this massive tradition in, in uh, that, that conceives of musical works as, as more fluid types of objects that may manifest themselves in a multitude of different kinds of radically different versions. Um, certainly this has been influence, influential in my own creative practice and also with Ensemble Offspring, of which I'm the co-director. And, and I think, you know, it's, it's, this is partly pragmatic reasons why we pursue the, some of these open work type uh, works, but also 
it's also partly about empowering musicians as artistically invested in uh, invested contributors to the creation of an artwork, not just sort of technical machines that do what the composer says. And indeed, most of the works that Ensemble Lost Spring is going to play in our concert in, in Musify Gamify on Friday night, I would put, I would call them game pieces, slightly in the tradition of John Zorn, I'm, you know, I'm sure some of you are familiar with, um, who basically, rather than presenting musicians with conventional scores, presents them with um, uh, sort of instructions, like, they're more like rules akin to a game uh, that govern the way in which musicians or performers interact or cooperate with ever, without ever specifying how they should sound. Um, or in the case of one of the works in the, in the concert by Stefano Negro uh, called Elastic Evolution, the interactivity goes beyond just a new dynamic between the, between the performers, but also includes audience participation. I mean, you can get online right now and influence how this work will look and sounds on Friday night. Um, so, I mean, this is just one of several sort of audience interactive projects that on some blossoming's developing in the, at the moment that sort of embrace the audience as you know as not just a passive uh, way but more of an interactive mm -hmm. kind of way um, and look I, and I, I've noticed that a lot even with my teaching at the conservatorium that uh, you know increasingly there's always students who are wanting to, to compose music for gaming type environments and you know, and yeah, and even if they are writing convention, more conventional musical material, not trying to reinvent sounds full stop, but um, they're still having to grapple with these, all of these dilemmas like how do, you, how, do you create, how do you compose in a modular way that doesn't necessarily go from beginning to end, or, or it might do so but not in a straight line. And I think you know, this is increasingly the challenge that, and fascinating kind of area that composers are starting to, to occupy is like how do you just translate data or like what you're saying, you know, how do you take all of these kind of uh, data points and make something creative with, with that? So there seems to be this tension between um, rehearsing something that's very scripted and this more generative approach to um, process of performance. Hmm. I mean, can you rehearse for the pieces you're doing on Friday night? We rehearse today. and. Well, certainly, I think you still, it's, it's like any game, you know, you train for it and, and uh, you know, you rehearse the way in which interactions can happen and, uh, and get better at it because, um, yeah, so rehearsal is yeah, still... Yeah, okay. There's always an element of unpredictability. Well, well, no, no two performances will be the same, obviously, mm. and um, mm. yeah, we don't know what will happen on Friday night, but okay. I guess. One way to find out. Yes, come. Come along. <laughs> yeah. Um, anyone want to respond to anyone's questions, or shall I fire one at you? A question. Mm -hmm. You know, with, with the, the gaming um, industry, we know it's the, the biggest entertainment <coughs> industry as a block, isn't it? I think it turns over more money than anything else. With music, it seems to me it's merely, it's mostly a soundtrack, and I'm probably wrong there. I'm sure that something here will prove me wrong. Is that correct? <laughs> uh, there's definitely exactly that. Uh, you know, games that. Um, actually put the music at the forefront of the experience. So right. two of the games, two of the kind of regular video, video games that we've got upstairs. In fact, three, because there's also a, an iPad app, which is, it's not actually musical, but we put it in there anyway. It's, um, but it's entirely sound-based. So right. you experience, there's, there's nothing on the screen except a little interface mm. that you can control, but you experience the whole game through sound. Right. So, okay. um, yeah, it's... Uh, I, I, I guess you'd say that the, you know, they're, they're kind of sub-genres of, of video game. Yeah. And maybe they don't need the title video game anymore. <laughs> mm. Mm. Um, yeah, I had a question, um, just throw it out there, that um, especially picking up from what Matt was saying about all these um, sensors and things that are out there and it's a software that can track <laughs> our behaviours these days, they can track our actions, they can tell us if we're sleepy, if we're excited and, and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but I'm wondering uh, on the other side of the coin also how, um, what choices you make as, as music makers or um, those kind of, how you actually maybe um, are creating new behaviours for audience, whether you think about it like that. So new ways that people move or new ways that they have to listen to music or is there like a new skill in that area that you have to start thinking about in terms of music consumption or generation? Yeah, well, we all know that, that, that technology has changed the way we consume music, don't we, you know? I mean, the MP3 was a classic, you know? That whole argument about vinyl or full-range uncompressed files versus MP3 mm -hmm. files, you know? 
the, 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 the notion of how we sort of use it, whatnot. There, you know, there's always a, a move forward and a kickback. I've, I've found that a lot of young musicians, as much as they want to adopt technology, they like to go back and have both camps looked after. So they'll happily go back and get a valve microphone or a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder or a, you know, a fuzz wow wow box or you know, a, a retro synth whilst they dabble in software and you know, they, it's, it's a, it's, they're mutually usable, I think, or, or loved these days. Mm. I think, uh, to your point about how it influences us, I think you know, if you look at some of the, the running apps tracking you know, your pace and stuff, and if you're lacking behind in the pace, and they, you know, they'll switch a track out to a higher BPM in order to get you kind of going and things like that. You know, with the project that I created, you know, watching the way some people were you know, using a fast sports car, but moving incredibly slowly. You know, I've never seen people drive a car so slowly, and that's because you know, they, were, they, they were creating new behaviors, and they were really interacting with things, and it's really interesting for me, the relationship between you know, what people will do based on you know, the music they're hearing. And mm -hmm. so you know, you can, I think that's well, mm -hmm. always been there, the emotional side of it. Yeah, I mean, often it can be a very personal experience, but as, um, as sound is probably becoming more embedded into everyday objects and environments as well, um, like upstairs we have Patsy, the designer Poof Doodle, which is a, a poof that has uh, sound and behaviours in it. And so um, I think there's going to be a lot more of that sort of coming up as well. So mm. uh, apart from um, people listening to music on the stereo, or on the headphones, or going to clubs and things like that, and radio, uh, that's still the more common forms of, of listening to music. But if yeah, there's suddenly all these things in the environment generating sounds, and I mean, how's that going to sort of impact on yes, Who was it mentioned, the Volkswagen idea? Uh, yeah, that's Matt. Yes, road, yes, yeah. that they, they had something to just, your behavior when you drove the car determined the music, is that right? It, uh, it changed, the, dynamically changed the composition. Yes. And uh, I responded that, that I've got a car that if you push the pedal too hard, it has a, a light that changes color just to sort of train you into being a better driver. <laughs> right, yes. Yeah. It, yeah. it's, yeah. it's too hard to watch the damn colors <laughs> change. You know, you'd rather hear some music. <laughs> exactly, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah, I think, yeah, there's a lot of that, that interaction stuff which is, yes. you know, yeah, it does heavily influence behaviour. Yeah. It is interesting to experiment with it. Not always yeah. for the road, though. Mm. But the other side of this is that, um, I mean, so you're, you're, you're talking about uh, the, the general, more general question of sound design, and, and that's one of the things that we've actually come together over in curating this event is, um, I mean, as, as in uh, you, Lian, not a musician, but an interaction designer and a performer of, of other things, mm -hmm. but... Um, the, all, of the, all of the ways in which we blur the boundaries between music and games in this exhibition, we're also you know, look at blurring the boundaries between music and other forms of sonic interaction. So we've, we've, we've introduced a sound game. We've got Patsy, the designer, Poof Doodle, who uh, I don't think is musical. Well, no, I'm sure Stephen would say he, uh, Stephen in the room. she is musical. Barking <laughs> um, uh, can be musical. <laughs> and. Um, that, so, so that kind of opens up this, this interesting middle ground where um, a musician's skill set might suddenly uh, come face to face with a, a designer's skill set who, you know, the designer, uh, the interaction designer has to understand um, this whole um, space of possible interaction scenarios and you're talking a lot to those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Damien, you kind of already touched on this, this issue of the musician, um, the kind of contemporary musician working with these kinds of musical ideas is already extremely familiar with, with that idea mm. that you're designing a space of possible interactions. So in that sense, there's, um, there's this really kind of quite stimulating theme of these types of overlap. And um, when we start to you know, take the existing sensor technology that, as you say, is just coming online at a really rapid rate and looking at all of the ways that um, composition becomes uh, 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 presents new challenges of, of, you know, you can't just decide that everything's going to be laid out exactly like this yeah. um, and make sure that all of those transitions are going to be exactly how you like them. And if you don't like a transition, you can just go back and edit it until you like it. You've now got to work on this in this kind of meta space of thinking about every possible transition. So the video game composer has to go around um, and it's quite in interesting to look at, you know, how a video game composer is actually sitting there working and auditioning their their music because they have to, I mean, there's a couple of ways you can do it, but one, the obvious way is to pick up the games controller and stop, stop playing the game and then cut back to the, cut back to the, set, the audio editor. And so that's a, quite a different way of working from 
just hitting play and, and then iterating. Mm. Um, yes, I've got this question here, um, I guess picking up on Damien's points there, but um, with this o the open work and this idea of generativity as well, that um, how, how that sort of plays into and you, this idea of modularity and what you're talking about, Ollie, with um, uh, having this stuff, you know, co uh, software that can generate different kinds of outputs and they're unpredictable, but maybe they also have a, a kind of structure in them. But versus the idea of crafting something to a really sophisticated level, like the sort of static work that can be quite crafted and um, you know, you can be virtuosic in the performance and things like that. Mm. So um, I think with Stephen, you talked as well about um, you know anyone now being able to pick up all kinds of um, you know thing and up on your mobile phone and supposedly like make music. Yeah. So yeah. Um, sort of. I mean, I suppose it depends on how it's used. I mean, you, you look at when the arpeggiator first appeared on a synthesizer and Giorgio Moroder made a disco track, you know, and, and it's like it, no one cared that he didn't actually play it physically. It was just utilised within the context of the song and the feeling, do you know? And obviously that's been taken to, to much further degrees than ever before with, as you said, oh, there's things you're talking about I don't know about, you know? And it just keeps pushing forward. Mm. Um, <coughs> so I think it does still come down to, the, the, you know, the, the human quality of creating something that, that either hits somebody's mm. emotionals or, or, or at least intellectual sort of atmospheric sort of level as well, you know? So, so getting, getting a hook, yeah. getting the right hook, yeah, yeah music hook there. Yeah. Probably yeah. a lot of people did care that um, this, that this guy wasn't did. actually playing into yeah, the yeah, right. that's, that's, and that, the fair light. Yeah, that, <laughs> yeah. That, that does happen, that there's this constant... Uh, now we love it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, but there's that, there's that constant discussion around that, you know. Like yes. I remember reading an early music technology book about, and it introduced drum machines and it said, but don't worry drummers because you, you're still, you're going to be the ones that are best at programming these things. Um, <laughs> I don't know if that's was ever true, I don't know if it's still true, but there's a certain truth in it. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, interesting. Right? That is true. <laughs> but there are a couple of very interesting uh, drum drum works in the uh, in the concert on Friday night, aren't there, with um, Robbie Avenham with his, uh, what do you call those sort of kinetic, robotic, maybe even mechatronic um, drums? Yeah, so, uh, instruments? Yeah, yeah, mechatronic, I guess. Yeah. Uh, um, so Robbie's an incredible um, improvising percussionist, and he's built, uh, as, as many interesting musicians have done, uh, they're kind of interested yeah. in at the moment of build, building mechanized versions of kind of what they do. Um, so he's got this kind of crazy Meccano kit of stuff that he can put in, put over his drum kit and and then just operate it from a, a kind of fader box or something. Yeah, I think he said, he, he spoke the other night at Dogbot and he did say he did start off, you know, a few years ago experimenting with um, a kind of products that could make things um, vibrate, such as vibrators, and sort of open those up and put them on the drum kit. And then a day sort of working with um, servo motors from um, aeroplane um, windscreen wipers. Is so they're, <laughs> they're so the ones that are powerful enough to the <laughs> get yeah. the really fast beat going. But what's fascinating yeah. is that he has, um, in this very kind of searchy way, found a way to make the machines really work. In, well, not necessarily just like he does, but with, yeah. with a, yeah. a compositional detail that is clearly his. And I mean, we see that a lot with people hacking. So in mechatronics, anything can trigger anything, can't they? You've got yeah. humidity or pressure or movement or light. Or they can all sort of interact, can't they? Yeah, I mean, he's just got, um, he's just controlling a piece of software which is then running different um, shifting tempi and, and so it's, it's, it's a generative music yes, process okay. in, you know, in the sense mm. that um, there's something running on the computer that, that ultimately dictates what's happening. Right. Yeah. But there's definitely a trend towards, I think, with um, you know these these sort of devices, which are really tiny computers on them now, with all kinds of sensors in them. That mm. there's so much you can do. I mm. mean, this is a piece of mechatronics in a way. Yes. Uh, or you could plug some more things that it can actually move and be kinetic, mm -hmm. even more so. But we'll probably be seeing more of that. Um, these different kinds of platforms for music making and um, 
I mean, tonight actually we're going to have Andrew Bluff's mobile phone orchestra, so you can download an app and uh, you can all sort of collectively create music together through um, this this piece that he's constructed for it. Tonight, we all can. Tonight, yeah, okay. upstairs in the exhibition. It plays music. It it goes through your iTunes or your whatever your your <laughs> music library. Does is, it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so you have to have a big think. Yeah. Have a big yeah. think about what's on there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what might come out. That's yeah. right. <laughs> well, those voice memos you've got in your iTunes <laughs> library. <laughs> <laughs> Could be some interesting things happening there. Okay, I think we'll actually turn over to the, open up to the audience. <coughs> um, hard to see you out there. We've been close in our little world up yeah. here. Um, so, would anyone like to ask a question? We have a microphone. Uh, Meredith will uh, run over to you. Don't be shy. <laughs> Here's one. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, down here. Yes. Sorry, uh, Stephen, I was interested in the point. Can you wait for your microphone? Sorry, just so everyone can hear the yeah. question. Uh, Oops, I think. Oh, okay. Sorry. Yeah, I'm paused. I'm just <laughs> interested in your thoughts on the business model for music in the future and how that might impact on the style of music that we're hearing because obviously money is a big driver. So just wondering if, what are your thoughts about how that might lead to the future of music. What do you see as big trends and? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm hungry for music and I will pay for any way I, I can. If I see something and it's there, I want to have it now. That's why the phone and the pad and the computer and boom, I'll take it, you know. And if there's, if they, what they think they call 360 degree albums or it's an app that, you know, that will come through quickly and it bypasses the store and it bypasses the, the label and it just goes directly to, you know, the creator or the owner of the music, I suppose. And I'm all for that, and I think there's a way of you know once once your 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 finances are logged in, your way you go. I think it's possible. So you're doing it now. Yeah. I think a bit, a bit from the generative side, and, you know, top, you know, um, dynamic composition side of things. You know, the longevity of well, or what is a piece of music, and how do you pay for a piece of music when it could be many different pieces of music. Um, I have no idea how that will affect it, but at the point where you're buying apps rather than, you know, downloads mm. from iTunes, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I mean, obviously streaming is having a big effect on all those models at the moment, you know, because mm. most people aren't like me. I like to own my music. I like to have hard ownership, you know, whereas I think the, the population want to I That's want to play that song, I just want to concept, happen to find it and play yeah. it. I, iTunes yeah. revenue is down, uh, for music is down for something like 15%, and that's entirely down to um, uh, streaming. Streaming, yeah. So, you know, the, that, what was the new business model is now the old business model. Yeah. So. yeah. I think an important part to consider, I mean, I, you're referring obviously to, um, in part, to, to this whole kind of transition that's taking place with. Uh, streaming and downloads, and, and that's a, such a hot topic of conversation. And I often feel that in that conversation, the um, obviously it depends who you're listening to, but um, the f it's, it's important to remember that, I mean, a musician's income has never always been by selling records. And sure. it, wasn't, um, it wasn't that <coughs> long ago that that wasn't even a thing. So, um, it, I mean, for example, being a, being a film composer or being a video game composer, you could have an extremely <coughs> lucrative career doing that kind of work without ever selling a record. And I mean, a lot of, a lot of people have very mixed incomes. It can be through syncing, you know, where you're, where you're getting, uh, you might be a film composer or you might just have a piece of music played on an advert and that, and that makes you lots of money. And um, uh, one thing I do think uh, may happen is that there's uh, an expansion of the possible ways that you can be um, an active creator of music, not necessarily you know kind of a star artist, but someone working behind the scenes to to um, deliver music for some context, um, and that is completely. I mean, it's a, each one of those industries uh, has its own economics, but that can be completely completely separate from all of the issues of copyright and uh, or you know the the inability to to defend copyright or to keep prices up or whatever. So I just, I just think that's an important part of um, that conversation, which is changing quickly. Mm. Okay, thank you. We have a question down here. Yes, hello. 
Um, Stephen, you mentioned something at the beginning that piqued my interest, and that was the mashups and sharing globally. I mean, SoundCloud comes to mind, um, and vast amounts of music being produced by people who are some talented, some just interested, <laughs> and some producing what would largely be considered mm. not, not worth listening to. Yeah. But um, what it results in is a huge a tsunami mm. of content yeah and so the process is not one of creating the content it's filtering it or curating yeah. it or determining yeah. what um, is useful or viable in a particular context now you cited some examples of musical traditions and how they evolved um, in the absence in fact probably because there was not that it was much more of a self-contained or enclosed environment do you see um, taking putting geography aside as the internet has done um, that there are cultures or communities developing, particularly in the context of the gamified music or the interactive or generative ways of creating, where you can see some creative movements coming out of lots of people collectively, wherever they might be around the world, sharing not just stems uh, and working on them as individual musicians, but perhaps being more interactively creative on a global scale. Well, I suppose it's possible. I mean, I think that you, you know we used to have singular, well, not quite singular, but you know, you, you'd go to you know, one radio station or one newspaper or magazine to get your information. And now, of course, you know, as you said, if you trust a radio station or if you trust a site, you know, which it is these days, not a magazine, you, that's all very good. But th things are moving so fast, you then have to have filters to find the filters, you know. Um, there are so many blog sites opening up all the time. And then you start to have to, you know, think very hard about what you're looking, what, who, who's writing and who's behind it. Um, but Will it open up all those possibilities? I'm, I'm absolutely positive it will, you know, but I think there's a lot of fear. I mean, Prince, for example, just wouldn't release anything, wouldn't do anything in any digital managed way because he hated the fact that the people were taking his music and not paying him for it, you know. So I think, you know, you're right, musicians are so used to not getting paid most of the time, you know, for the highly skilled people they are, they're probably the, one of the poorest paid individuals. And they're usually very intelligent people. Um, Something has got to be rejigged and rebuilt, doesn't it? How they get paid for that, like that, that you know, a, a, a model for payment and for business, I don't know, you know, but nothing would surprise me. Nothing would surprise me. But you're right, there's, there's just so much information out there. I've given up pretending I'm even on top of it, you know, and as has most of the people I know in the business of, of being the, the music programmers at radio stations or the, the editors of magazines or blogs or whatever. So it's yep. difficult. Yeah, and of course the generativity is a kind of extra layer on the tsunami of just everyone making stuff. So there is already uh, out there, you can go online and use a service that will generate copyright free music for you and that copyright free music has been generated by a computer and that computer has just been churning through possible tunes and running some algorithm to decide if they're good or bad. and. Um, uh, I mean, I think the claims made about how good that system is are, are overcooked, but um, you know, you can see where we might be heading where not, o not only is everyone making stuff, but everyone's got a machine that mass produces stuff. So, <laughs> you know, expect something very different in the future. But of course, I mean, one thing, um, I'm probably going to get myself in hot water by trying to bring up a philosopher, but um, uh, Jacques Attali uh, is uh, the a philosopher who wrote a, wrote a very influential book about um, how music was kind of evolving in the modern age uh, called Noise. And he kind of anticipates this point where we, he talks about stop music as stockpiling time. So it's basically like you can build up a, a collection of music very easily that's um, completely beyond your capacity to um, actually listen to. I mean, we all have that. If, if we have a streaming service, we've already got uh, more music that we can listen to. And, and this uh, album in A Thousand Variations I, I was involved in was a month's worth of music. So great, I managed to produce a month's worth of music. Um, and that, that's all kind of a bit nasty when you think about how are we supposed to value this stuff if we're, if we're producing so much of it that we can't listen to it. And uh, one of the things that Tally brings in is, is this idea that actually the participatory aspect of, of musical experience uh, comes kind of full circle, comes back to the fore of how uh, we, we give or we experience value. So that's why some of these uh, interactive technologies might might be of interest in um, quite significant ways as we arrive at that point where um, music is inundated. Mm. So moving from a consumer model to a, a kind of co-creation model mm. of how we value creativity, basically. Yeah. 
Yeah, more questions? Oops. There's one here. Hi, um, we touched on this a little bit earlier and I think Matt was talking to it as well. Um, I find the, uh, the latest um, uh, development from Spotify really fascinating. Just in the last few days, they've been, they've launched um, uh, the latest development, which is uh, they the app can recognise the time of day and then it will play the music that you like at that time of day accordingly. And the same as the running, they can you can go running and it will recognise the BPM you're at and then it'll play the next track, the next track to match the BPM. Um, I think they're really exciting developments, but I'd be interested in your thoughts on. Do you think this is a, a good development for the for the music industry? Do you think it's in, in that you know it, it means that people are, are discovering more music that they wouldn't necessarily be discovering, or do you think it's bad in that the decision to actually listen to music is, is being taken away from you and 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 being made by essentially you know um, a, a company? Um, and I'd also be interested to hear your thoughts on you know this is the latest evolution. How does it evolve from here? I think it's a really good question. <laughs> um, and but it touches on so many of the issues, right? First, from you know, your point about um, this, you know, how do we manage as as uh, as listeners, you know, this vast array of content? And I think, you know, I personally embrace the democratization of music, but you know, we start building these filters or personalization engines or whatnot that that Spotify add to us, you know, to select our you know, individual soundtracks for our lives, depending on, on these various parameters, which also is also coming back to, to your work in terms of, you know, what, you know, and I, I actually find this area very fascinating, but I think, you know, there's a real uh, skill in, in the creativity involved in, in curation, and I think, you know, a lot of the role of the composer these days is often one of, cr of creating systems that recognize how to join tracks together, how to um, relate that to the personal situations of a, of a given individual. And you know, so we see yeah, moving more in the, into the realm of, of curation rather than creation, perhaps. Mm. So that idea of a sort of systems approach to music making as well. Mm. So you don't actually create the, the modular content, you're just well, how to join things together. I mean, I, I'm increasingly seeing, you know, the role of the composers as someone who who's, who sets up systems that elicit creativity mm. or, or are able to organise it in coherent and interesting kinds of mm. ways. Mm. I mean, if, if you've got the world's music at your fingertips, supposing, at any given time, and you had a logarithm that said, if you like that, like they do on iTunes, you might like this, I think that's a good thing. Mm. I've often forgotten about an artist, you know, from, say, 1972 that sounded like that, but, but I didn't have. You know, I don't think that's a bad thing if it's yeah. following I mean, your path. The problem is that you often lose the, the social shared experience of music, I guess. So yeah. there is this argument that increasingly music is becoming a more private phenomenon. Uh, so that yes. rather than, yeah, because music is mostly enjoyed in a social situation, whether yeah. it's a, a rock concert, a nightclub, a concert hall, a, a community choir, or whatever, you know, it's, it's people getting together and sharing mm -hmm. the same musical experience. Whereas, you know, when you go home on a train and you know you've got 100 people with their headphones on, all in their individual musical worlds, um, you know, you don't have that same kind of connection. But then there's the other. Yeah. So is that, one, is that one of your visions of uh, transforming like interesting public transport? Of, you know, mm. if it becomes <laughs> less individual or uh, what your friends are like. Well, well, I think the other side of all of this is we're talking about recorded product, and you know, as someone who's involved with uh, co organising concerts, I think you know the the experiential facet of, of live performance, you know, it actually mm. brings <clears> that back up as a valuable, uh, you know, uh, experience to, mm. you know, reintroducing value into this mass world of, of content. I was chatting to a guy from Audio, which is another one of, another streaming provider uh, <laughs> like Spotify, and um, I was begging him that, because uh, I, I, I love streaming as a way of getting my music because I lose and scratch CDs and I'm even worse with, I mean, downloaded files are much easier to lose than CDs. Um, so, so I love it, uh, but of course there's only half the stuff I want to listen to and that drives me crazy. Um, yeah, okay. And I was begging him to uh, make the world a better place by making sure that all the content is on there. And I, I mean, I, that's, that's, that's a 
touchy subject, obviously, because <laughs> that's up to the artists if they want it to be on there. But his point was that in, well, he, he was selling me the idea that in a few years' time that I won't have to worry about that, it'll all, you know, all, it, everything will be aggregated and so on. And of course, many people may say that's a horrible future and that will never happen. But that these companies, if they're going to compete, they're going to compete on the service they provide and the experience mm -hmm. they provide. And he was um, very excited about uh, getting deals with uh, major car manufacturers to make sure that RDO was on their onboard computer and, and this kind of stuff, which um, I don't know, who knows where that's going. But this, but this, this issue of discovery is actually, um, uh, I, I'm constantly surprised at how bad it is. Uh, how, how, you know, I mean, the recommendation stuff uh, usually works best when it's ridiculously naive, which is basically uh, the people who listen to this also listen to this, or uh, basically just recommend me another record by an artist that I already yeah. like. Yeah. Um, or you get stuck in like the same thing. And if you like Sun, <laughs> if you like Sun Ra, then Spotify is just constantly giving new Sun, Sun Ra albums because there's about 300 of them. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's going to be hopefully, a, I mean, that discovery stuff uh, can, I mean, there's such a complex social dimension to that, how, how well that discovery um, service works. And I mean, I wouldn't, I, I, yeah, I think it still comes down mm -hmm. to having good mates who've got better taste in music than you, that's how I've... For some survived. reason I'm just so getting far. this scenario, if you can't get the real thing, you're going to get the weird Al, Al Yankovic kind of co cover of it and then you have to make do. Yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm going to have to bring the talk to a close, but um, just to, to sort of recap on the future of music as we've been exploring it tonight, um, from our four our panelists, Stephen, Ollie, Matt and Damien, it's been um, some really interesting ideas around there. Um, from a sort of overwhelming volume of music, how to move, uh, how to actually create that volume, both, both Stephen and mm -hmm. I think um, Damien taught to, um, you know, different kinds of musical genres of writing for very specific contexts. How can we do that with this, you know, digital, um, you know, uh, kind of networked everything that we're in? Um, no one mentioned the brown note, but that was one way to we might be m moving towards with um, <laughs> just uh, generating everything possible towards the homogenous brown note. Oh, yes. Um, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, some of the, uh, I guess, the interesting features coming up with um, the ability to use data generated from all kinds of sources, from, from our own actions and feelings to the environment to weather patterns and all kinds of things that start to um, generate sounds that become blended in all kinds mm. of ways. and new forms of creativity. So I um, just want to thank our speakers very much for um, being part of the panel. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and just to uh, let you know of a few things that are coming up. So um, the next Sydney Ideas talk is on Friday night. It's called I'm Not Racist But, which proves to be a very um, interesting conversation. So um, spread the word about that one. Um, we have the two concerts coming up um, Friday night with Ensemble Offspring. Uh, Robbie Avenham and Chris Abrahams are performing. Um, Michaela Davies is doing something as well. And uh, Alon Ilsa is playing air sticks with Del Lamata on the uh, Lucas Abella's mini pinball machine, which is actually upstairs. And on Saturday night, uh, I'm going to let Ollie actually do the, uh, <laughs> the list of names for that. But we've, Saturday night concert. We've got Paul Heslin from Canberra. We've got the Infocetic Orchestra, which is actually a, an orchestra that uses data in their music. Um, we've got uh, video game composer David Kanaga, who's not here in person, but he's sent a video game for us to play with Austin Bucket, a uh, local uh, improvising pianist. And we've got 7-Bit Hero from um, Brisbane, who are a band that um, perform with video games and audience interaction as part of the performance. So I think a lot of, uh, a lot of the um, our shows uh, were actually pushing the, the boundaries of um, musical ex uh, practice and experience. So uh, please come along if you can. I'd just like to thank again the Seymour Centre and Sydney Ideas for um, um, having this talk uh, and Vivid as well. And then uh, I'd like to invite you to move upstairs, uh, upstairs for you outside the Everest Theatre for the launch of the Musify Gamify exhibition. So Ollie and I are the curators of that. I've been working hard at um, putting it all together. There's a whole range of stuff you can actually play with. So I think there's one work that's not part of our exhibition that's a light thing that says do not touch. But all the other things are basically please come and touch and play. Um, there are game controllers, there are sound floors, you can jump on, there are all kinds of things. Come and have a good time. Uh, there are free drinks upstairs as well, so we'd love you to join us. Thank, Thank you, everybody, you. for coming.